I see it's easy often to look at someone else and say, oh, that's the Pharisee. Uh, I see the Pharisee and the rel religiosity in others. I see an external uh, religious service in, in other people, but I can't see the Pharisee in myself. And that passage where it says, first take out the log in your own eye, and then you can clearly see. And so for me, as I was listening this morning, I was like, Lord, I want to take out the log. I want to see where, Lord, that Pharisee is in myself, Lord. I don't want to think of anybody else, Lord, because if I'm a Pharisee, I will not be a lover of God. And, and for me, I was, uh, I was thinking of that uh, passage with um, the prodigal son, where he did not see his need. He didn't, he didn't know that there was anything wrong with him. Uh, turn with me to Luke 15, verse 29. And if I read this, past, this verse, I can, I can say this for myself. Luke 15, 29. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you. Can I say that? Yeah, I can say that. I can say that for so many years I've been serving you. I've not neglected a command of yours, and never you have given me a young goat so that I may celebrate with my friends. I can have that attitude that, Lord, what am I, what am I going to get out of this? Is it going to be heaven? Is it going to be I feel good about myself that I've done something good? What, what am I getting out of it? For the younger son, he was saying, verse 22, Luke 15, 22, but the father said to his, uh, actually 21, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And it says in verse 19, actually, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. He came and said, you know, Lord, what, Father, I don't deserve to be your son. You tell me whatever you want me to do, and I'll do it. I'll do it with gratitude and joy, but that, that's not the important thing. Just you receiving me into this house after I've done what I've done, I'm very thankful for that. The rest of the life, I will do what my older brother is doing and what I should have been doing, doing everything that you command me in the house, but I'm not going to do it because necessarily because that's going to bring some lamb that I can celebrate with my friends. I'm doing this because of what you've done for me. And I see that, and the reason I say that, I want to see that in my heart. When Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, one thing he said, you clean, verse Luke 23, I mean, sorry, Matthew 23, verse 25, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, woe to Ajay, if, you're, if I'm a hypocrite, for you clean the outside of the cup. When you go to the church meetings, when you are in public, your cup is very good on the outside. But inside, they're full of robbery. That means there's something selfish thing that you want to get out of it. It could be honor. Something you're looking for. Nobody else can see it. They all can see the outside of the cup. Inside the cup, which only the Lord can see, is there's, some, there's a robbery, a lust for something and self-indulgence. I love myself. Whatever myself asks for, I give it to myself. Self asks me to lust over here, I lust over there. If self says that, say that mean word, I say it. On the outside though, nobody can see that. Outside the, the cup is clean, the inside is what? Who can see the inside of my cup? The Lord can see it, and I can see it. And for each one of us, it's very easy to go and say, oh, that person has a good, <laughs> a good cup on the outside and it's not clean in the inside but for me I want to see Lord they don't know the inside of my cup they can only see the outside of my cup Lord I see the inside Lord I want to judge myself Lord and if I've been judging myself that way I know like uh, Mary uh, John turn with me to John 12 
Jesus, therefore, six days before Passover, John 12, 1, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, and Jesus raised from the dead. So they had made a supper there, and Mary was serving, but Lazarus was one of one those reclining at the table with him. Mary took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. And I was thinking, you know, her love for Jesus cost her something. And she, again, it, later down it says it was 300 denarii, meaning a year's worth of salary. So each one of us can close our eyes and think of how much our salary is for a year. That's how much this was costing her. And her brother and sister were there. Maybe her, her parents also were there. In her mind, she had to calculate the cost of pouring this one year worth of perfume. What's her mom going to say? What's her dad going to say? What's her siblings going to say? What are the disciples going to say? Maybe her parents didn't say anything out loud, but the disciples definitely did. What their parents probably were thinking, the disciples said out loud. And the house was filled with perfume. Verse 4, then Judas Iscariot, and in, one, in, in the other passage in Matthew, it says all the disciples were saying this thing, who was intending to betray him, said, why was this perfume not, perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? And it says in one place that, you know, why was this a waste? <laughs> why was this wasted? And he says, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor, but you do not always have it. She has done something with this 300 denarii of perfume, which is for my burial. And I see, for me, if I want to be one who loves Jesus in this way, there might be reproach, as we heard. There's going to be reproach. Why are you doing this for Jesus? But it, am I going to be worried about what others think about my devotion to Jesus, what others may say? Or am I going to love Jesus more than father, mother, brother, sister, and even my own self? And Luke 23, and I'll close with this, Luke 23, it says, when it came to time for burial, and it took in verse uh, 20, uh, chapter 23, Luke 23, verse 53, and he took it down, meaning the body of Jesus, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid him in the tomb, cut into the rock where there's no one ever lain. It was the prepar preparation day and the Sabbath, and it was about to begin. Now the woman, verse 55, who had come with him out of Galilee, followed and saw the tomb and how he, his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes. And on the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. So these women also wanted to put the perfume on Jesus' body. Verse, chapter 24, verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And so... They wanted to. They wanted to put the perfume. They wanted to cover the body of Jesus, but they didn't have the opportunity. The only one who had the opportunity was what, the one who had to pay a great cost of a year's salary was the only one who had the opportunity to prepare Jesus' body for the burial. And if I want to be a lover of Jesus, that's what it's going to take, or, or else I will lose that opportunity like those women. They didn't have the opportunity. Even if they wanted to love Jesus the same way, Mary did. They didn't have the opportunity afterwards. And so for me, the message is for me. Where is self-indulgence in my life, Lord? And Lord, have I, have I loved in this way? Where you mean more to me than any, anyone else. And I'm willing to show it to you in secret where no one else sees. May the Lord help us. Amen. In Joshua 24, right before Joshua died, 
And at the time, he was instructing the, uh, the Israelites and encouraging them to set their hearts on the Lord, be devoted to God, and serve him with all their hearts. In verse 16, I want to read the response of the Jews, the Israelites, to, to uh, Joshua. Joshua had encouraged them, persuaded them, and they said to him, verse 16 of Joshua 24, God forbid that we will forsake God and serve other gods, for the Lord is our God. He brought us out, and so forth. They were determined to serve God after hearing Joshua's sermon. We're going to serve him. We're going to do it. And much less as we've heard this morning about loving Jesus, which is the most important thing, surely the most important thing. I wonder if our response can be from this stirring, this is the day I'm going to love Jesus and do and set my heart on him. But hear what Joshua tells them in verse 19. Joshua says to them, you cannot serve the Lord. And I feel that way, and I'm saying it also to us as well. You cannot love the Lord Jesus in your own strength. That's what Joshua was telling them. Your determination cannot do it. Your zeal cannot do it. You cannot love the Lord Jesus of your own strength. It is why the Bible speaks of being baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Everything I've heard this morning, I realize impossible of my own strength. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, I can do it. It's very important. That's what I take out from this whole message here. You cannot do it to love Jesus, to love God with all your heart, your soul, your might. Impossible. That's why that verse in Romans 5, 5 is critical. The love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. In John 14, Jesus describes what it means to love him several times in that chapter. John 14, and even in the book of John, that's one thing I noticed. John writes about loving God, which simply means, he says in 1 John 4, 2 John, he says the same. It is to keep God's commandments. John 14, verse 15. But if you see in the midst of all this, keeping my commandments, as Jesus was telling them, he always also speaks about the Holy Spirit. John 14, 15, the one who, who loves me is the one who keeps my commandments. And then verse 16, which is a continuation of what he says there, and I will pray the Father, and he'll give you another comforter that he may abide with you, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Those two verses there tell me exactly what I'm saying here. To love Jesus, to keep his commandments, I couldn't do it. But Jesus says to me, I'm going to pray for you for the spirit of truth. John 16, 13 says, it is that spirit of truth who guides you. It's going to guide you and show you how to do it, how to love me, how to keep my commandments. I want to encourage each one of us. We must be filled with the Holy Spirit. You cannot sustain your love for God, even the true love for others in your own strength. The fire will soon dull out and quench and die out. It's not going to take long. But if the Holy Spirit fills our hearts and encourages us, all the things that we heard, God can help us do them. To have a zeal for Christ, the zeal for the church, the zeal for prayer meetings, and all those things that no one would need to tell you to do. But there's a fire burning within you to do them. So I want to encourage us cry out for the filling of God's Spirit. He makes the difference. Amen.